Uh, unification, I don't think is going to actually happen in our lifetime. I think North Korea is going to be around for a very long time because uh, there's really no signs that the country is like, going to be destabilized anytime soon. I mean, people have predicted for the last 70 years, uh, well, you know, Kim Il-sung passed away the first leader. So that means, you know, North Korea just can't move on from this. But, you know, it did. It went through a very terrible famine in the 1990s that everybody thought would be the end, but it still continued on. And then when Kim Jong-il passed away in 2011, everybody thought, oh, well, Kim Jong-un is like this young kid. There's nothing that he can do. The country's going to like not last under his leadership. But he's been in power for 10 years and, you know, he's made North Korea arguably an even stronger country. <laughs>
And it just shows you that because even though like Japan is like, you know, a good ally of the US, it's a very open country. We get so much stuff wrong about Japan, but North Korea is even more cut off. It's the most probably the most cut off country from the rest of the world. So I think that leads to more misinformation about the country. And I always try to say that North Korea, it has probably the worst human rights situation in the world. But something like that doesn't need exaggeration. And I think it's better that if we look at these countries accurately and what reflects the reality of the situation without overstating the case. And I think that's the better strategy, the better way of going to it. Yeah, uh, fair, fair. Um, so what was some of the stuff that when you so you when you were in Japan versus so when you were back here in the States, where are some ideas that you had that you found out when you went to Japan, you had woefully wrong or you just kind of had the wrong idea? Um, it, it's fine. You know, as long as you're uncomfortable sharing. I mean, I don't want to embarrass oh, sure. you too much. Yeah, well, uh, one thing was just like the way that uh, we express our emotions, I think, compared to Japanese people and just East Asian people in general. So um, coming from like an East Asian background, I always knew that like, you know, my dad was, I guess, like tougher on me and my brother than my mother was because she's from a more Canadian background, a more Western background. So I kind of wondered, like, where did this whole like disciplinary uh, kind of mentality come from? Or where did like this more like tough love kind of thing come from? Mm -hmm. And I sort of just realized that it's because like East Asian countries are just way more competitive than I think uh, we are in the West. Now, in America, there are a lot of people who have issues with work life balance. Obviously, there's lots of people in America who do multiple jobs and they struggle just to get by. But I think that in Japan, uh, seeing like the dedication that people have to their work, whether they want to or whether they, they don't, uh, that sort of uh, surprised me just to see like how... Uh, how much of like, a, I think even a worse work-life balance there is in Japan compared to the US. But also in terms of how people express themselves uh, in America, I realized that we kind of overshare a lot. We were very prone to like being very friendly to strangers, to people that we meet. Mm -hmm. Whereas here in Japan, it takes much longer to be good friends with people and to form long lasting relationships. But once you do form those relationships, you can really rely on them. Whereas I find that in America, we kind of gain friends as easily as we lose them. Yeah, that seems fair. Uh Work culture is definitely interesting. I think one of the things, especially people who um, are nerds back here, I think sometimes we feel like because of what we see in anime or in pop culture that we think then that means in Japan they're really it's really permissive and open and that reflects what you see on the show <laughs> is how it actually is over there. And you're saying that's that's just not the case. Yeah. And also it, it like, first off, it really depends on the company here at too. So there's uh, places that are called uh, Black Kaisha. It's like uh, black companies. So these are the companies that really push their employees like really hard. The ones that have unpaid overtime and like the ones that really like, it's like really tough to, to like work there long term. So there's a lot of companies like that throughout Japan, but there's also, you know, a good startup scene in Japan as well, where there's more people branching on and doing their own thing. And by working outside of that system, they're able to have a happier life. But I kind of think that just goes from like how like basically your life's path in Japan is sort of structured. So, um, for example, in high school, there's like these things called entrance exams where all like Japanese middle school students have to take these like very intense like uh, entrance exams just to get into a good high school. And then once you're out of like high school to go into university, you also have to take entrance exams. It's, I guess, sort of similar to what we have like ACT, SAT tests in, in the U.S., but it's like each university has their own specific entrance exams and depending on the university, it can be much harder. So it's a very stressful time period for a, uh, you know, young Japanese person. But then once you get into university, it really doesn't matter particularly what you study, just that you got into a good university to begin with. So, depending on what university you went to, then you can go into like a better company and then your company that determines like, determines like, you know, what your income is going to be starting out. So this like set path that people have, it's led to a very low homeless rate in Japan because Japan is some of the lowest homeless rates in like, the entire world. But it, despite that, it's led to, I think, a lot of like unhappiness at times and to a lot of stress among people. So it's sort of like, you know, trade-offs depending on like, how you look at it. Yeah, definitely. I could definitely can see it out here where it feels like the institutions you're working in they don't really care what happens to you. Like, you know, you're just, you're just anyone could fill those seats. And it seems like, at least from my point of view, Japan, where they have a culture where you can end up, you know, the mm -hmm. company you start working as adult is the one you die in or, or you yeah. retire in. Well, well, it, it was it, it was uh, like that for sure, like a few decades ago. Now that's sort of like transitioning out of that form because it's just so hard to keep people in one place these days, like anywhere, no matter what country you go to. But I think for sure there's less of, I think, uh, people looking down on somebody for doing a sort of like lesser paying job. Because, I mean, there's stories of like old people here who they just they work in fast food restaurants because they want to. They just don't want to be staying home all day. So uh, they decide voluntarily to like, you know, get out of like retirement, and just work part time someplace because they just enjoy doing that. 
Are those stories about the insane work hours that required, especially people like who are salarymen, are those true? You know, because I you hear some things where like sixteen hours or more. You know, if you're really yeah. committed, you're almost never leaving the office. Is there truth sure. to that, or it's exaggeration? Well, I, well, I mean, I think probably those like media stories they take like the worst case scenarios out of like ev- like that they can possibly find. Because in, in the U.S., we do that too. We look at like the worst like worst death and like deaths at work or like some like accident at work. And if you're as a foreigner looking at those stories, you might think, "Wow, America is a really dangerous country." If like you can like die on the job and like the company doesn't seem to care about you. So to some extent, that does exist. But also, I do think that there is this there is this culture here where like you're not expected to leave before the boss leaves. So. Whereas in America, we have like a specific like nine to five job to to, to, mm-hmm. to begin with. Over here, it's like even if it's like 5 p.m., you could be staying at work until seven or like, you know, eight, depending on just like how heavy the workload is. So there's a lot of like social pressure to stay uh, in your company and to stay like in, in the workplace environment if everybody is still there. And if you decide to leave and you go home early, you'll kind of be looked down upon as like the one person that's just not putting in the same effort as, as everybody else. Ooh, I would not fare well. <laughs> That would be that would be tough. Um, I I so you as an uh, American, was it tough for you to acclimate to Japanese culture? Do you feel like you mm-hmm. were easily accepted? You know, you, the workplace, but not just the workplace. Maybe in university or your daily life. Uh, well, yeah, yes and no, because again, I'm from an East Asian background, so I had some sense of like how uh, East Asian people were like uh, China and Japan. They're not exactly the same, but they do have some similarities between each other, between like how mm-hmm. um, the, the cultural mentality among the people. So I uh, I kind of had because I grew up in that environment, I had some experience with that. But uh, other things that sort of like I had to adjust to more just be less selfish, really. It's just that like, uh I don't know if we're going to get into like politics or something on this episode, but I used to be more into like libertarian circles before I went to Japan. But then since coming to Japan, I sort of realized, well, this really doesn't exist outside of America. And uh, the sort of like rugged individualism that we have in the US, that's not really that much of a thing over here. There's still individualism and you still have your own opinions, but there's way more emphasis on the collective over here. So to adjust to that, I think was a bit more difficult. But in regards to like work, oh, sorry, just in regards to like work in university. So I worked at a glass plant for like three months when I first came to Japan for like an internship. And that actually wasn't so bad because it was in the countryside. It was a relatively like a modern progressive company. So people weren't really staying until like, you know, 8 or 9 p.m. It seemed to be pretty normal work hours. So that was a good experience for me. But again, it kind of depends on what company you end up being at. Yeah, you you hear a lot of... And one of the annoyances, of course, that probably is around this conversation for a lot of people in the West is, of course, a certain show that came out on HBO <laughs> based on a certain book by a fairly spurious journalist, uh, which uh, oh. I, yeah, yeah, I don't want to go too much into that. You mean you're talking about Tokyo Vice by uh, Jake Oh, yeah, Addison. no, maybe. I might. Yeah, no, Tokyo right. Vice. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, well, you see, that's the other thing. Well, th- that's actually like a different example. That's somebody who's actually been here for a long time and who's uh, se- like sort of selling a particular narrative about Japan to sort of uh, fill his own pocketbook, I think. And um, to his uh, credit, I think it's impressive that he was like one of the few, like the first foreign journalists in Japan at a time when there were just very few people in that space. So he deserves credit for like being there. But I kind of think it's irresponsible, like how much misinformation he's spreading about Japan. And a lot of the stuff that he claims in his book has been refuted by other people. Yeah, and I think he's. I think there are some people that kind of want that you know, for Westerns who are interested in the topic, they want to um, emphasize the eccentricities or how different it is, like mm-hmm. you know, to to you know, because it sells better. It's an easier sell, you yeah. know, especially when like well, now like he's the brave yak, he's the brave reporter fighting the yakuza when you know instead of just like he was a reporter yeah. covering the yakuza. But anyhow, that's besides the point. Sure. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, what about the fun stuff? So Japanese culture, you, I'm sure you enjoyed that back at home uh, since you were still in Japan. Did, were you yeah. into anime as a high schooler or video games or any of that? Uh, yeah, you know, as much as the average person is, I think. Uh, for me, it was mostly just games before anime because I just, uh, I'm a kid. I was born in 1997, so I grew up with like Game Boy Advance, you know, GameCube, Wii, that sort of thing. So I like played those video games, but for the longest time without conscious, you know, knowledge that they were Japanese. I think like a lot of people, it's only like later, like later on that I figured, oh, so this is from like another country. And that's why things are so different compared to like, you know, what I'm used to in a, a Western entertainment. So yeah, from there, I, I liked uh, JRPGs. I liked visual novels. And that was actually one motivation factor to learn Japanese because uh, 
especially like 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, there were just less things released in English. There was a lot of things that were just only in Japan. Mm -hmm. So all these like untranslated games, I figured, well, you know, if I'm learning Japanese, it'd be a nice bonus to know, you know, to play these games that I can't play in the US. So that was also another motivating factor. So what what are some things the people probably have? Are there impressions people get from Japanese entertainment about the country that are less than helpful or they they aren't true? Are there things though that like people do understand about Japanese culture or J Japan itself from like the entertainment, you know, whatever they watch, whether it's like a, a piece of anime or they're, I don't know, they like Hello Kitty. I don't know, but you know. <laughs> Well, I think if we're just talking about like in generalities, I think the fact that like if Japan is like a weirder country than America is, because when we see and a lot of people have that impression just from watching anime or playing video games. But I kind of say, well, that's like if you watch just David Lynch movies and you think, OK, then this is just represents all of America. <laughs> There's a lot of like plenty of like weird entertainment that uh, people watch. I think that like that uh, Japanese people could watch from America that get, shapes their perspective of America. So if you watch just Quentin Tarantino films, well, wow, America is a pretty violent country. Then I guess this is just like a normal occurrence every single day like the stuff that happens in Pulp Fiction. So I think just like being conscious that like what is portrayed in entertainment doesn't necessarily reflect what daily life is. I think that's important for understanding any country. That's fair. Uh, you know, one of the interesting things you brought up what we've uh, messaged before, you said that, that that there are, of course, Weebos from he basically for those who aren't familiar with the term, these are people who are obsessed with Japan, but don't really know much about the country or haven't lived there. And mm -hmm. they sometimes have a lot of erroneous ideas about uh, about that. But you told me that actually as many Weibos as there are over here in the West, that there are Japanese Weibo equivalents for for Western culture, uh, yes. which, which is fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Well, I think the most famous example is Hideo Kojima, the creator of Metal Gear and the creator <laughs> of uh, That's Death true. Stranding. Yeah, if you just look at his Twitter account, he's just posting about like every Western like album or like movie or whatever that he's watching. But yeah, no, there's plenty of people like that. There's people where they have just of like an idealistic image of what the West is like than you know a lot of weeaboos have about what Japan is like. And again, that just goes from what I said, being able to disconnect, you know, portrayal in media versus what daily life is like. So what are the other fascinating aspects of Japan that you like that you think are an improvement over the West? Like Mm -hmm. I hear people often say they're a bit they're a bigger fan of like the healthcare system over there or the, the food, yeah. of course, is great. Um etiquette. Sure. Yeah. Uh well convenient the public transportation is really good for one thing. I like better here than in the US. Public transportation yeah. is one of those. I think that the uh trains and the buses in Japan are just generally much better than what we have in the States. And that I think just has to do with the way infrastructure uh, is done over here. America is a very big, uh, expansive country. It's a car culture for one thing. So a lot of people ask, like, so why can't there be like, you know, this huge, like uh, the equivalent of like the Shinkansen, the bullet train from like, you know, like New York to Los Angeles? Well, mm -hmm. because America is a big country and it'd be like really hard, I think, to cut across like so much and to go through all those roads and everything with like just a rail system. You would have to, we're talking about like a trillion dollar project, I, I'd imagine. Of like, you know, upending everything and like restructuring all the infrastructure in the US. But Japan is a small island country the size of California. So it's much more manageable and much easier to do something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's much more, the populace is much more packed for the most part. Yeah. yeah. Was it, did, was it similar to when you were, when you were working at the, in the, the, the company that was in the country? Did they have a lot more, I mean, did they have public infrastructure in that way or did you have to find other ways to get around yeah, the the countryside is a bit is a, a bit of a different thing. That's where you really need a car because there are buses, but there's just less of them. But a lot of people ride bicycles in Japan too. So because the the way that the roads are, uh, usually it's like pretty uh, it's pretty rideable to go just from point A to point B with a bicycle. So I did that too when I lived in the countryside. But yeah, occasionally I did need a ride from other people. But you know, I think learning how to drive in the countryside is a much less stressful experience than it would be like in the big city. So. Uh, if I were to live in the country one day, I would want to get a driver's license here, but I don't have one yet. Uh, what do you think of like the medical system out there? What do you think mm -hmm. about, I I don't know, uh, the school system, you know, because you were in the mm -hmm. university. Sure. Well, the university that I was in, what I've been to Japanese universities, but the programs that I'm in are aimed at more just for people studying abroad. But I've taken a mixture of classes, both that are in English and in Japanese. So I kind of got like a bit of both. Um well, to be perfectly frank, college in Japan is not anywhere near as competitive as it is in the States. Once you get in college, the hardest part of like college in Japan is just is getting in. But the actual study, like it's a graduation rate of like 99.9%. You really have to go out of your way to screw up or not do the work to not graduate from university here in Japan. 
Yeah. Have you had any experience? I mean, I, the, the healthcare there, I, I don't know. Some I've, I've re- talked to some people and they were like, yeah, you know, like maybe it's not highest in quality, but it is much more reliable. But you're a pretty mm-hmm. healthy guy. So I don't know how much experience you might have with all that. Yeah, I've never, well, I've never been like uh, to the point where I've been seriously injured where I have to take advantage of like the healthcare system, but I have like gone for just regular checkups or whatever. And yeah, it is cheaper uh, than, you know, the US obviously, because it's all like covered under national health insurance. But like with any national health insurance, I have to do with long wait times. Uh, sometimes like, you know, if you need a special, special kind of surgery, they might not necessarily have that here. And that's why you hear those stories of people who go to the US to get those special medical procedures. So um, it really just depends on like what you really need. But I think that for like most situations, it should be fine. Okay. Yeah. I could see the plus and the plus and minuses with that. Yeah. What I, what I always just try to emphasize with like, uh, when I just talk about Japan is like where you live is based off of what trade-offs you're willing to accept. So all countries have their goods and their good and positive aspects. So uh, I, I hate like the doomer attitude where like everything in Japan is terrible and you know, they will never fit in here. You'll never live here. But I also, again, don't like the weeaboo attitude either where everything in Japan is like hundred percent perfect. And it's like utopia because you know, there is no utopia. Okay. What do the weebos have right though? What, what are they, what do they understand correctly? If there uh, is something. Yeah, sure. To, to, to steel man, the weeaboos, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, what they Still have is like, way. yeah, the, I mean, th- there's a reason why like Japanese entertainment is so like beloved o- overseas and across the world. It's just because it's the, the the best Japanese games and like the best Japanese anime. They do a type of storytelling that is very culturally unique to Japan, and I, I, that's why I think people are so attracted to things like uh, Studio Ghibli films or like Final Fantasy or that that sort of thing. So, in terms of like you know cultural output that a country can be proud of, yeah, I think Japan does have that to be proud of, and also. Other things like the nice scenery and the good food, that's all stuff that, you know, I think is very much true. The only thing is, is just like when you can go to any country as like a tourist, you can enjoy all of those things, but you don't have to actually live and work there. Once you move to a country and you have to start working there, that's when you have to start uh, kind of figuring out like, okay, do I enjoy the things here more than I dislike the things here? That's like where you have to come to like a conclusion once you actually live in a country. Yep. Yep. More realistic expectations instead of just thinking like a tourist that gets, uh, you know, it's a lollygag everywhere. That makes sense. Um, what about things you hear, you hear about, like a focus in the in the West on Japan is about the population crisis, that this is mm-hmm. a, a major... Yeah. Is this as big an issue? Japan, do they talk about this a lot? Is this like a big um, discussion? Uh, that's the perception it is from out here. Oh, yeah, for sure. They do. That is uh, discussed a lot on, on television, especially also just uh, things of like declining rates of marriage and just declining rates of just like people having boyfriends and girlfriends. You know, they're, they're, that just seems to be an issue. And also um, the population crisis is especially bad in the countryside because all the young people are leaving the countryside to move to the cities. So if you go to like Tokyo or Kyoto or Kobe or whatever, you wouldn't necessarily think, oh, what do you mean that Japan's population is declined? There's so many people here crammed into one space. Well, that's because you're in the big cities. Once you go to the countrysides, you go to like places that have like maybe like 30, 40,000 people in just like one town, you really start to realize just how like less of a shortage of young people there are in those places. So a lot of, of those states are, it's not states, the prefectures, they try to like get around that by advertising tourism to get more people to come to those places to raise more, you know, uh, revenue through tourism. So that's one avenue that some places are trying to use, but it's no real su- substitute for like, you know, permanent people living in a country. And other people, politicians, like in many countries, they suggest, well, why not just letting in more foreigners to work in a to work in Japan? And they'll solve the population crisis. Well, the amount of foreigners that come in Japan, there's like 98 percent of people here are Japanese and the rest are foreigners. Even if you like uh, doubled the amount of foreigners coming into Japan, that still wouldn't be enough to really substantially influence the demographics here. So really, the only solution is for Japanese people to have more kids. So why hasn't, I mean, this is something they've probably been working on 20, 30 years now. How come, is it just because the inevitable decline of materialist countries or what do you think is going on there? Yeah, that's a that, that's a thing that like a lot of people are going to debate. There's a philosophical aspect, yeah. I'm sure. There's an economic aspect. It really just depends on who you ask. But I just think that it's just much har- economically harder to take care of kids for the most part in all, all countries. I noticed that a lot of people, I guess around, you're probably around the same age as me, right? In your Pretty close, yeah. Yeah. You probably notice a lot of people in our age demographic, even in America, they don't really want to have kids or they're putting off kids mm-hmm. because they just say it's just too expensive and I don't have the resources to take care of uh, children in my household. Well, that's the same problem here, really. 
especially because we're especially now we're dealing with inflation that uh, Japan for, well first not Japan in Japan's case specifically after like the bubble burst the economic bubble burst in like the early 90s they went through an extended recession which led to other economic issues so that's one reason for population declining but the other issue is like I said all across the world people are just ha- struggling to get by because of like, just current economic issues so that's I think uh, the biggest reason why people aren't having kids. Yeah, no, it's easier to say than it is to do, especially if you have to meet high expectations and Mm -hmm. you have to get that job, you have to hold the job, you have to find a partner. You you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to it. I think, yeah, even here in the West, I think you see in family formation, I think it's going more and more towards the, you know, people doing it in their 30s or not at all. Yeah. I just think Japan might just be so much more ahead of us on this issue, but this is kind of, I kind of get the feeling like the West or people that are, um, not that Japan is the West, though in some in some ways it is. Uh, yeah. But you know, this is just kind of where the countries are going, and it's just a matter of you know the pecking order, uh, how far you're into this. But I feel like they're all sliding in that direction. Yeah. Well, also for what it's worth, most people that I talk to here, like around my, they say they want to have kids. They just want to have them later on. Whereas like, I think in the U S there's just a lot of people just for multiple reasons, just say they don't want to have kids. They don't plan on having kids. So that's also, I think a difference between uh, both countries. Yeah. Oh, well, that's too bad. Uh, yeah, I know that's like, that's like the bajillion dollar question. If so, if we could, if a little, if, uh, a little podcaster like me could somehow figure that out, uh, I, I'd be doing yeah. something else. Well, that, um, that, that, well, that was the meme with uh, Shinzo Abe because Abe really wanted to push for like more people to have kids, but uh, unfortunately was assassinated uh, earlier this year, as I'm sure that, you've seen. Yeah, that was awful. That was, that was horrific. Uh, it's like, yeah. It, yeah, and he, he, Shinzo Abe is, is a pretty spectacular, was a pretty spectacular person and politician. I mean, obviously there's controversy there, sure. uh, but, uh, yeah, that is crazy. What, what was the reaction like in, uh, out there? When, when all that happened, I, yeah, I can't well, even imagine. Sh- yeah, for sh- shock, for sure. Everybody, no matter what your political beliefs were, like in Japan, everybody was just shocked that like somebody like that could be assassinated in broad daylight. And it really raised issues about like security. I think a lot of Japanese politicians are just going to have a he- way tougher security detail than before. Because as you know, Japan's not a country that is really known for gun violence. Yeah. Is that a cultural thing? What? Because you- people always want to tout that out here when they want to talk about the uh the the gun issue or gun violence issue you know with uh schools uh and kids all that they you often point to japan like if we did things like japan does then we wouldn't have that problem is is there some truth to that or is that just they just don't really understand the differences in the two societies well i mean america was founded on violent armed revolution that's that's the reason why america (laughs) exists as a country for for one thing and like if you go back even in the 1600s american colonists had rifles people had like cannons people had guns in like your local town so that's just like a difference i think of like uh, cultural origin i i tell people telling americans to stop shooting guns is like telling japanese people to stop eating sushi it's just not going to happen yeah so yeah yeah and uh yeah well there is like a negative image of guns in japan like for most for the most part but it is possible to get guns if like you know you're a farmer in the countryside and you need to defend your crops against like bears or boars or like uh, other animal pests people like them they actually do need rifles just to protect what they have and to protect their livestock and things like that so that's an, ex- an example of like practical use of guns in japan but the uh idea of like widespread civilian ownership uh weapons like in japan it's just not gonna happen i don't think and uh, if there was gonna an opportunity for that to happen, it would have been when we occupied Japan after World War II because we rewrote their constitution essentially. But uh, interesting enough, there was no Second Amendment in that constitution, probably because we didn't want the Japanese people rebelling against the American occupying forces. Yeah, one of the major focuses of Shinzo Abe, it seemed like his long term plan. I don't know if he stated this outright. A lot of people said that this is what he wanted to do. That he kind of wanted to undo a lot of the changes uh, mm-hmm. made by the United States, in particular when it came to the the Japanese military well you yeah. guys technically the don't GSDF. have mm-hmm. one yeah uh what was it accurate uh, and people were saying you know many japanese when they thought of the idea that the, maybe we would uh give them you know I, I hate to use give them but uh that they would have an official military that they would have these uh things again that they really haven't had since world war ii what was the feeling you got from from out there in japan were people mm-hmm. in favor of this or are they still kind of aghast or I, I I always wonder because it's so hard from where I'm sitting to understand the perception. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, well, yeah, so you're correct that Abe's, uh, one of his biggest political goals was to revise Article 9 of the Constitution of Japan, and that just present, prevents Japan from like being able to cl declare war on other countries and to have like an offensive military, similar to what we have, you know, what South Korea has, what, what most democratic countries have. So there was a lot of opposition to that in most of Abe's tenure because just people didn't want Japan to go back to war because of, you know, memories of World War II. But just anecdotally, and when I just get a sense of people now, I think that's changing because keep in mind, we're surrounded by North Korea, China, and Russia. So North Korea shoots missiles uh, in close proximity to us, especially now, quite often. China is like uh, threatening to invade Taiwan, and uh, Russia is having the war in Ukraine, and they also have territorial disputes with Japan. So there's a sort of changing feeling among Japanese people that maybe it is time for Japan to sort of go towards that direction, because peace is good. Peace was good in the post-war era, but we're in a, because of just geopolitical realities, eternal peace just might not be viable anymore. Yeah, that's that's some scary stuff going on out there. So that's kind of where I want to move this towards uh, with your work covering North Korea and the political situation. Um, you've had a few uh, Japan's had a few near misses this year with uh, with North Korea lobbing missiles at you guys. Yeah, well, um, the most recent one was at early November. So there was like an ICBM that like came very close to Japan. Um, that that was very notable because the last time, they, so ICBM stands for like an intercontinental ballistic yeah. missile. It's like a long long range weapon. Um, so the last time they tested a weapon like that was five years ago in 2017. And um, as your viewers might know, that was like the height of tensions between the U.S. and North Korea, between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong Un. They were constantly trading insults against each other, and they were, you know they're all the missile testing. Yeah, li little rocket man. <laughs> little rocket man yeah <laughs> well uh so but then uh, as of course you know after that there was like rounds of diplomacy between the us and north korea and also uh, north korea and south korea but because that diplomacy ultimately failed north korea is back to basically being uh you know way more provocative and testing way more missiles there's uh, a lot of speculation that they're going to test a nuclear weapon any day now sometime maybe this year or early next year so because of that increasingly uh, dangerous security situation, there's a lot of like uh, meetings between US, Japan, South Korea, just about strengthening military alliances, improving defenses. And of course, in the back of everybody's mind, it's like, can Japan ever reform Article 9 of the Constitution? And uh, it doesn't seem likely for the time being because Kishida is not really the current Prime Minister Kishida. He's not very uh, gung ho on doing that. But uh, who knows, though? It really just depends. If the security situation uh, around us becomes that intense, that could be the way that people vote. Yeah, and Japan has a has a parliament or has a parliamentary system, essentially, yes. right? Yeah, yeah, so that's that's way different than what we do in the U.S. It's yeah, a it's, a, I, it's probably closer to what you see like in England or like other European countries. Yeah, because they had uh, uh, they had Suga. I'm not yeah. saying his name right. I'm sure no, that's correct. A little yeah, bit, but, and then he was, yeah, Suga. and then he was gone. He was like he was there, and then he wasn't. I was like, what? What happened? Yeah, Are you well, on to the next guy? Well, that that that's how those uh, systems. Like England is the same thing. If the prime minister screws up very badly, or is like pressure to resign, uh, he or she will resign, and then like, the next person can take over after the party decides who's going to be the next leader of the party. So Japan works in a very similar way. Where Abe he resigned because of health reasons, and he was the longest running post war prime minister. So uh, that paved way for Suga, and then Suga stepped down, and they voted for Kishida. So he's the current PM. Politics out there, like even with the even with the conservatives, you were saying that when you when you went over there, you were fairly libertarian. But when you yeah. engaged, there wasn't a lot of libertarian politics to engage with. Is that because Japanese politics, in the sense of conservative, is like they engage with an older world or an imperialist world or just a older way of looking at things versus here in the U.S. where we have that very um, yeah. uh, Adam Smith or uh, sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the the big thing is because like we're talking about like healthcare, for example, like all the parties in Japan support like, you know, a social safety net. And the more that I sort of like thought about other countries, most conservative parties in most countries do support some kind of social security net. It's really only like American Republicans where they're very like individualist, where it all should be privatized or you should you should be able to pay for it yourself. That's a very American way of thinking. Whereas over here, it's like political suicide to say that, you know, we should get we should cut funding for seniors. We should, you know, uh, make health care all private. Privatized. And I think that's just a big reason because Japan has such a huge elderly population. Taking care of the elderly here is like a very important political issue. And like that's just like not negotiable. Yeah. No, I can't even imagine. And it's the, the, the 65 plus are like one of the biggest voting blocks out here in the US. I can't even imagine Japan <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> with the number of guys you got there. Holy cow. That would be a, that would be a scary bunch to, to yeah. offend. 
Now, to give you an idea of how old people are over here, so the oldest World War II veteran passed away last month. He was 112 years old. Wow. Yeah. Dang. Uh, it is it is incredible when you think how many people are still alive that can remember World War II or just the yeah. few, or just coming off of it. And well, well, uh, my Chinese grandmother she passed away last month, but she was ninety seven years old. Dang, sorry about that. That's sad to hear. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, she lived through the Japanese occupation of Manchuria during World War II, and she came to Tokyo during the war as well. So your background with your family dealing with um, uh, the stuff with Mao. That yeah. kind of that's that led to your interest in stuff with North Korea. What what are the kind of stuff you do in your job uh, as a researcher and writer on mm -hmm. that? Um, sure. How do you think your background influences that? And what are you seeing? What what, what are the, what do you think we're going to see next in the ongoing saga of North Korea? Mm -hmm. And the uh, well, I think a lot of people are going to come to the conclusion that North Korea is just never going to denuclearize. I don't see any indication that they're going to get rid of their nuclear weapons. That was. Uh, the biggest thing between negotiations between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong Un about, you know, when they like uh, met in Singapore in 2018, one of like the points like on their uh, declaration that they signed was like the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. But that wording is very interesting. Notice complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, not North Korea. So that means that South Korea can't have nu nuclear weapons either. But now because of how bad the security system is, uh, sorry, the security situation is, um. A pl plethora of South Koreans actually support arming themselves with nuclear weapons. So if South Korea decides to go into that direction, I think there could be even more security tensions on in this part of the world. Yeah, if that's indeed possible. Just yeah. I mean, we see this with like uh, Ukraine and Russia. So um, as you know, in the 90s, the US and uh, some other countries basically pressured or pushed Ukraine to denuclearize in exchange for security guarantees. And now that because Russia is invading them, there's sort of the sense, well, was that a mistake? Should Ukraine have still had its nuclear weapons? Well, now it's a very similar thing with North and South Korea. If North Korea is developing these nuclear weapons, does it make sense for South Korea to not have nuclear weapons, to just have conventional weapons? Is there a tension between South Koreans and the Japanese? Uh, that's one of those things you do read in the news. Is that true? Oh, yes, very much so. <laughs> For uh, Basically, since like the end of World War II until now, there's always been a lot of tension between Japan and both Koreas. But it comes and goes in waves. So um, a very famous like uh, issue between both of them is uh, comfort women between uh, Japan mm -hmm. and South Korea. I'm not sure if you've heard of this issue before. I'm, I'm aware. Yes, it was. Uh, it, it, for those who aren't aware, Imperial Japan, they would force many populations into being basically prostitutes for soldiers and officials. Uh, yes. and, it, and of course, Japan, uh, Korea was one of the first people that they colonized. Yes. And it was the Koreans have long stated that they had done this en masse in the Koreas. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also other parts of Asia, too. So, but yeah, it's a, that that itself is a very big uh, political point between Japan and uh, uh, South Korea and also North Korea to an extent as well, because remember, it was one Korea until like the Korean War. So, but yeah, uh, basically, like uh, Japan has given, uh, you know, millions of dollars in financial settlements to South Korea. They have given multiple official apologies, but there's a part of like South Korean politics where it's always going to be anti-Japan no matter what, because it's just an easy scapegoat for when things are going badly. And um, a key turning point. So in 2015, there was supposed to be so uh, the Japanese government under Shinzo Abe came to a financial agreement with the park government of uh, South Korea. But the issue was, was that even though Japan gave all this money to the park government, their president, as you know, she was connected to like this religious cult. There was a whole like scandal where she had to resign and she was arrested. It was like an ongoing. Are you familiar with this? Uh, I am not. Like this is interesting. So there's a the yeah. South Korean president was affiliated with a cult. What? Yeah, so Park Young Hee, so she was like, it's a very convoluted uh, uh, story. So basically, like, um, one of her like advisors was basically being like controlled by like this religious cult, and so the controversy was like that religious cult was controlling the president of South Korea. So it led to like widespread protests in South Korea. So she had to resign, and that led to like uh, the the next president, Moon Jae-in. It's a very complicated topic that I think is beyond the scope of this podcast, but. <laughs> But uh, what you need to know, though, anyway, is like because of like this whole like uh, scandal, she had to like resign. And so that put like, you know, uh, relations like in huge like disarray, like what direction is like South Korea going to go in with like the rest, you know, its neighbors. So under the park government, originally Japan gave 
them like a settlement to like basically compensation for like any survivors of like the colonial period. This is the money, you know, where we apologize for everything. This is like, you know, the, the reparations, so to speak. But what happened was because that government was very corrupt, the money didn't really go to the people that it was supposed to. And a lot of those victims, they didn't weren't even consulted with about this deal to begin with. So they were very unhappy with this deal. But the Japanese side is basically saying, but we gave you the money and we already apologized. So whatever happens, that's up to you guys. This has nothing to do with us. But then the next government basically said, well, no, we have to like go back to negotiations. And so because the current, the Moon Jae-in government kept bringing it up with Japan, it just led to further tensions down the road. So it got so bad, uh, so bad that around like 2019, they were like uh, threatening to like cut off like really important economic relations between both sides. So, and also like information sharing. So it was a very difficult situation. Are there, I know that South Korea, I actually watched the Seer Minari, which is a fantastic show from Apple, but it does go into some of that. It does go into the tensions of the feelings of identity and, you know, how, how awful Imperial Japan was to a lot of people, uh, you know, often that include the Japanese, but you know, that usually doesn't get mentioned. Um, yeah, from my, my perspective, I, I can see, I guess, yeah, that would be extremely contentious. From my perspective, it's like, with China out there causing as many problems as they are, uh, people worried about World War III. And of course, you have North Korea. You just you really hope, like, come on, South Koreans, Japanese, let's put yeah. this aside. Let's work together. But I guess from your perspective, if you felt your grandma was forced into mm -hmm. uh, servitude and prostitution, that would be a little hard to let go. Yeah, well, my in my experience, so like, yeah, I'm from a Chinese background, and they had to live under the occupation. For them, it wasn't like that bad because my great grandfather, he was actually the chauffeur for the Japanese mayor of Shenyang, so he had like a pretty decent living while he was also stealing fuel and like selling on the black market on the side. So sort of doing like uh, two roles, both like being you know having a good job, but also selling stuff on the black market. But yeah, because of that, my grandmother and her sister they got to go to a very good Japanese language school until she passed away. She spoke Japanese fluently. So she wow. didn't actually have, yeah, she didn't actually have like that negative feelings towards Japan because she understood, yeah, it's war and, you know, it wasn't good for like anybody. But I mean, that's just the way the things were back then. But that's just her perspective. I understand totally that there's other people who had like way worse experiences under Japanese colonialism. So they're more bitter in comparison. But I think the more important thing is like right now we're dealing with so many security issues from China and from North Korea. I think it's more important to focus on present day issues than to constantly dwell on the past. And it's more like, you know, don't forget, but I think you have to forgive eventually. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. Uh, and do the younger generations in Japan, do they do they, are they do they kind of want to move on from this issue more? Is it a thing mm -hmm. where like the older people are more hardline or conservative and they're just don't really want to? Yeah. And well, they, it's interesting they, because like, among a lot of young people in Japan, there's a lot of interest in like K-pop and like Korean dramas and, you know, Korean food. And so there's a lot of like soft uh, power, soft culture that's like sort of being exchanged between both sides. And uh, I mean, like public opinion is still very low, uh, like public opinion of like how people feel about like each other is still pretty low, but it has sort of marginally increased a little bit in the, the last couple of years. So I think there is like some signs of things getting better, but it's really just, you know, what direction does the young generation want to take things in? And I think a lot of young Japanese people, like they don't want to be hit over the head with what happened in the past. But then also, there's also like a lot of like uh, South Koreans and like Chinese that because of just uh, the product of their education, they're basically told to hate Japan. They're taught to hate Japan. So that's very hard to undo that kind of education, I think. Yeah, I would. There are different societies, a different issue. But here in the U.S., we have issues like concerns about slavery or things yeah. that uh, people did in the past. And yeah. You know, it's, it's those are hard things to get over. I don't have a good answer for how to deal with that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You yeah. might have, you might have also you might have also just heard about like stories of like a historical revi revisionism in Japan, where like you know people who deny things like Nanking and like deny like those war crimes and stuff like that. So there are people who are like that, but there's like I think hardcore revisionists in like every country. And the official Japanese government policy about these things is like, yeah, this stuff did happen, and we do apologize for it. So I think stuff like that is more important. And I think it's unfortunately it gets forgotten among like, you know, the extremists on both sides. Uh, that seems to be human nature. It's as true as it yes. is out there in the Pacific than it is here. Uh, so where do you, you know, from your vantage point and your expertise, where do you think we're going with China and North Korea? Do you think we're really headed to war? Do you think the Kims will ever give up power and the Koreas mm -hmm. will be united? What do you think? Uh, unification, I don't think is going to actually happen in our lifetime. I think North Korea is going to be around for a very long time because uh, there's really no signs that the country is like, going to be destabilized anytime soon. I mean, 
people have predicted for the last 70 years, oh, well, you know, Kim Il-sung passed away, the first leader. So that means, you know, North Korea just can't move on from this. But, you know, it did. It went through a very terrible famine in the 1990s that everybody thought would be the end, but it still continued on. And then when Kim Jong-il passed away in 2011, everybody thought, oh, well, Kim Jong-un is like this young kid. There's nothing that he can do. The country's going to like not last under his leadership. But he's been in power for 10 years. And, you know, he's made North Korea arguably an even stronger country because of the nuclear weapons and because of the missile testing. So I still think they're going to be around for a very long time. And even though we make, we make, we make fun of Kim Jong-un for being very like fat and obese or whatever, but I, I, there's really no suggestion that he's, his life is going to be cut short anytime soon. Yeah. And there was that weird thing. Remember, I remember doing the, uh, the Olympics a few years ago where they were obsessed with his sister. That was a yes, strange yeah. time. <laughs> so yeah, what, for sure. Yeah. But then also, well, yeah, but in regards to like, uh, you know, uh, unification. So a lot of South Koreans, especially like younger people, they're not really on board with that because who's going to uh, foot the bill when that happens? Uh, South mm. Koreans. It's going to we're talking about like 25 million people, the majority of whom probably don't even know how to turn on a computer or trying to integrate with, you know, such a high tech advanced society. It would be a really big disaster without like, you know, I think years of like integration and like years of like, you know, close supervision. Yeah, that's a good point, because even when you had unification between Western and East Germany, that was only a generation difference. So yeah. you still had there were plenty of people that, you know, had brothers or sisters, cousins or uncles on either side, whereas I think we're getting to the point when the length of time now where it's going to be like, I don't know anyone over there. Why? Why would I care? Yeah. Ugh. And also there's a lot of people who say, well, why can't North Korea just be like Singapore or like Vietnam, where it's technically still like an authoritarian government, so to speak, but there's still economic freedom and the people are relatively happy. You can leave the country freely, all that sort of thing. Well, the reason why it can't be that way is because if North Koreans find out that like how better off the rest of the world is, they're not going to want like the Kims to be around. Like Kim Jong-un is the reason why like North Korea is not like Vietnam, because if there's too much economic liberalization, he'll lose his power and then uh, it would be the end of his regime. So uh, the regime definitely cares more about holding on to power than, you know, becoming like an economically successful country, uh, open country like Vietnam or Singapore. Yeah. Years ago, I knew a guy that had um, uh, gone over, you know, to help, um, uh, you know, doctors that uh, cross. No, I don't know. They don't. Doctors Can't Without Borders. Name. Thank you. Doctors Without Borders. Some, a similar organization. They had gone over there to help do um, basic eye care. So they would, you know, things that we normally yeah. always deal with. And he, they said the weirdest thing was they would do these procedures and they'd be done. And then the person, I mean, they'd be polite, but they weren't so much grateful to those that came to do the eye care, but they were grateful to the Kims. Yeah. And to the, to the person I was talking about, was like, how do you even begin to like to help them understand you're here because of that guy? You know, <laughs> how do you even tell someone when they have an almost religious devotion to the, yeah. to the, great leader and that's well the, the hard part is those like i i'm sure i'm sure there's people that believe like that as you said literally but also i'm sure were there like any cameras or were there like other people like in the room because if there's like a lot of there, there's always going to be like minders in the room when stuff like that happens so probably a lot of those people they don't want to say anything that would get them into trouble just by talking to foreigners so i think that's also part of it too oh well, it could okay that uh, does i don't know it's, it's maybe i'm not i'm not sure because again this person I, I, Again, it's like it's like when my dad grew up in like the culture revolution under Mao Zedong. He didn't believe in any of the stuff that was going on, and I think he wagered that most people didn't believe either. But like, there's a there's a kind of a point where like you have to pretend you believe, and maybe when you start pretending to believe, maybe you actually do start believing it, and to some extent, it's it's very easy for like you and me to like look at this objectively because we have the internet, we have like you know other sources of information. But if you're grown up in that environment and that's all that you know, it's very hard to escape from that indoctrination, even if like in your heart you don't actually believe in it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so maybe we'll end here. What do you think is going to happen with China? Are we headed? Are you headed to World War Three? Is Taiwan toast? I pray not. But uh... yeah, <laughs> yeah, I hope not either. I think that like right now, uh, China is looking closely at the war in Ukraine to see like you know how is this going to turn out because they've already seen the huge international response of like all the aid being sent over to Ukraine. So they know very well for sure if like if they attacked Taiwan, the whole like America, South Korea probably japan too like all these countries would just start having a very strong military response uh to to china so they're really just like weighing their options to see like you know what i think would be more realistic but with what happened in ukraine it does show you that, that we have to take what people like kim jong-un and what xi jinping say seriously because Definitely. you know there's a lot of saber rattling there's a lot of like you know uh these people are sworn enemies, you know we're going to take them over it may sound like just like saber rattling but it's only saber rattling until it's not 
Yeah, it is interesting. Part of me felt, especially how Hong Kong was handled, that he's like, well, yes. Thailand, 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 Taiwan, there's no chance. But now we've responded to uh, Russia's invasion to Ukraine. So now I don't know what to think. Yeah, uh, Hong, Hong Kong is a, is a tragedy for sure. Because like, like before our very eyes, we're seeing like a formerly free territory just becoming another province of China, you know, and it's happening way quicker than anybody thought it would. Yeah. And, and Hong Kong was like a libertarian sweat dream. Like, so yeah. that, that, that was <laughs> always that all, was like the to all the time. I, well, it's funny because I wrote a piece about like Hong Kong, North Korea relations and uh, North Korea likes Hong Kong because it's so easy to set up a business. There's so many shell companies that lead to like uh, North Korea being able to like escape sanctions and to like have these illegal business dealings. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, man, I hope I hope the news does get better. I, I think, you know, J Japanese culture is so fascinating. I find I it has so enriched my life in so many ways, even if I am a weeb, a sad weebo. Um, and you know, I, I have great hopes for that whole region. I really do hope it, 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 I don't want to go to war. I don't want these bad things to happen, but, uh, that's not what you're paid well, to do. Well, you're paid to do is to figure yeah. out what actually is going to happen and what actually is going on. Yeah. Well, the borders are open also for tourism too. So I definitely encourage you to come visit Japan one day and I'll show you the, the grand tour. I will have to do that. I will hold you to that offer. All right. Well, thank you so much, Oliver. You were awesome. It's a 15 hour time differential between he and I. He is late night after a day of working and it is I starting my day. So it's crazy, yeah. but Oliver was willing to do it. So thank you so much, Oliver. This was a lot of fun. Very interesting. Uh, to all those who, uh, oh, by the way, uh, be sure to follow Oliver on Twitter. What is your handle again? Yes, it's uh, Oliver Ja 1014. So O L I V E R J I A 1014. And of course, they can find you on NHK News, where you were a writer and editor. NK over News. There. N NHK NK News. NK News? No, N NK News. <laughs> okay, thank you. Go there. You know what I said. Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the, the time differential does make a difference. It does. Okay, well, this has been a lot of fun. I wish you all the best. Until next time, my friends, keep geeking out.